Right. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Bill, Wynn, and um, Walter, for inviting me here. It's really a privilege. And um, I think I have to start by um, explaining a little bit about my title. Um, <coughs> I talk about the women who made Uladva possible, and I start the title saying, well, they are game changers. Um, game changer as an element or factor that changes an existing situation or activity in a significant way. Um, one of the things that I miss most um, about Wales when I'm in Patagonia is good radio. I miss Radio 4 a lot. So I listen to Radio 4 po post podcasts, and especially the Women's Hour podcasts. And last year, they had a whole section about the game changers, the, the women who are game changers in Britain. And listening to those post podcasts, I started thinking, well, who are our game changers? Um, and in fact, um, I would think that most or all of the women that uh, were in, in Uladva or helped create Uladva um, are game changers. Um, but I especially started to think about those women who came on the Mimosa, and okay, some others who came later, and um, <coughs> thinking of them really as um, game changers. And I really am convinced that Uladva would not be what it is today if it weren't for them. Thinking in terms of Patagonia, I know that you know, I can stop anybody in the street and ask them, OK, do you know who Lewis Jones is? Do you know who Michael D. Jones is? And they would all know who they are. But if I ask them who Gwen Liam Thomas is or who Betty Hughes is, nobody would know. Um, so that's how this uh, sort of uh, little paper came about. So um, I'm going to start um, talking about. Uh, I'm just going to mention some of um, some of the uh, the women. You know, I would I would like to have the time to talk about each one of those who came in the mimosa and many more who, who came afterwards. But well, I have to, I've, I've had to select some. So I'm going to start with Anne Lloyd. Uh, she was an only child from a wealthy family. When she married her husband, not only did she give support to his plans, but also provided the necessary funds to cover the initial expenses of this venture, of his venture, of creating a Welsh settlement in Patagonia. And she kept helping and covering expenses, so much so that at one point she did find that all her furniture from her house had been auctioned to pay for the bailiffs. She had four children, two of whom, Mihangel and Fluid, ended their days on the other side of the Atlantic. You may have guessed by now that Anne Lloyd married Michael D. Jones. And speaking about her fortune, um, I suspect that those, what was it, 800 pounds or 8,000 pounds that you uh, said that were needed uh, to adapt the mimosa, I suspect that they may have come from um, her fortune, actually. 8,000, yeah. Um, her two sons were encouraged to study at university and to be prepared to help their community. <laughs> While some reports indicate that having lost her fortune and two children in Patagonia, she was not necessarily very fond of the place, <laughs> Albina Jones-Sampini mentions that when a resident of Uladva visited Wales in 1913, and by this time Anne was 82, and would die 12 years later, she said goodbye to this person with the words, ask the people in Chubut to pray for me. I pray for them every night. Um, recently, I found, I, I heard um, um, from Lynette, actually, that uh, Michael D. Jones proposed to her uh, in English um, by letter, and he had to wait for her answer, like, you know, several weeks. 
But obviously she said yes. And uh, I'm told that the, the, the letter is actually at the archive in Bangor, so it would be interesting to see that. Um, so yes, uh, this is Ellen um, Anne Lloyd. Yeah. My next um, woman is Ellen Griffith, born in Holyhead, and that's the place where she married at the age of 19 in August 1859. At 25, she went to Patagonia with her husband, Lewis Jones, and with Edwin Roberts, that is Edwin Roberts, not her husband. Um, she accompanied them. Um, when they, they traveled um, to Patagonia ahead of the arrival of the rest of the group to prepare the place and wait for them in the new bay. However, uh, while in Patagonia, she fell off a horse and was advised not to travel further until she recovered. So she was left behind when Edwin and Lewis left on June the 10th. Ellen and Lewis had a son who died at an, at an early age. And um, in Lewis Jones' diary um, of 1862, when he was um, uh, looking for the River Kamui, um, there is a note of him worrying about um, her, his wife and his, uh, his son. Uh, unfortunately, the child died afterwards. Um, they also had two daughters, yeah? Uh, when Lewis Jones left for Buenos Aires after some settlers complained about the condition of the place, Hel Ellen continued to Wales where her daughter Mavanwi was born, uh, although obviously she was conceived in Argentine <laughs> soil, yeah. Um, Lewis Jones returned to the valley in 1867, and after a short while, he settled his young family there. Um, Ellen died in 1930, and although the Maria Cemetery was no longer being used as a cemetery, they allowed for her remains to rest with those of her husband. She's described as a faithful partner to Lewis Jones, even though, because of his travels or her visits to Wales with her daughters, they spent a lot of time apart. However, they used to keep separate diaries that they would later compare when they met again after their travels. Um, when she and Thomas was born in Merthyr Tydfil on January 1842, the daughter of a blacksmith. She married in 1863 to a man 10 years her senior. Before she married, she ran a small millinery shop and she was the one who provided hats for many of the brides that got married in Uladva. While still in Wales, she fell into a deep depression when her mother died. And she is said to have persuaded her husband, Abraham Matthews, to travel to Patagonia and start a new life. They traveled in the Mimosa together with their daughter, Mary Annie, who was six months old then, and with Wentlian's brother, John Murray Thomas. So we all know about John Murray Thomas. How many of us knew about his sister? Later in Uladva, she gave birth to two more daughters and two sons. Again, in 1894, while they were in Wales trying to recruit more settlers for the colony, she persuaded Abram Matthews to go back to Patagonia. The records talk about her as a very assertive woman with a strong personality who always faced every difficulty as a challenge to be overcome. In 1865, she led a group of women who would ride between Porth Madring uh, and Trerauson to bring to the valley the cargo brought on the mimosa. When she was not leading the women, she would teach small children to read by cutting letters from all newspapers and showing them how to string them together into words or, and then phrases. phrases. She was a very generous woman and was always aware of who might need some help. Many new arrivals spent time at their home before, uh, that is at, at Gwenslian's and Abram's uh, how, home, before they settled in their new homes. Her husband died 23 years before her. 
As a widow, she moved to Trelew, where her house remained open to all those who needed a helpful hand. There is a story about her renting a room to one of the managers of the Echemec, who had moved from Puerto Deseado to Trelew. However, she rented the room on condition that he would attend Sunday service, that is it, the service in chapel every Sunday, and he promised he would do so but he didn't. <laughs> when when Chilian heard about this abs his absence in chapel, he was told in no uncertain terms <laughs> that he had to vacate the room. She died on March 27, 1922, when she was 80. The doctor who assisted her, Hector Ramirez Calderón, reports that her last words were, I hear singing. She is buried in Moria together with her husband, Abraham Matthews, who had died in 1899. Elizabeth Harriet Adams was from this city, from Cardiff. She was married to Maurice Humphreys, and they traveled together with his two brothers, Lewis, who was a minister, and John. She gave birth to Mary, the first girl to be born in Ulatva. Elizabeth was 21 when she gave birth to Mary, and later gave birth to six other children. When they arrived at the new bay, the whole group decided that Elizabeth would be the first one on the boats to land due to how advanced her pregnancy was. Soon, however, they left the colony for a few years since they needed to, ca to take care of Lewis in Patagones, in Patagones uh, for he was sick. But they returned to the valley after about eight years. Yes, that's her. I'm using mostly uh, the photograph of the, 18, uh, the 1890 photograph, um, although there are a few others as well. But Anne Jones traveled with her family from Mountain Ash. She was 18 when she boarded the Mimosa and she married Edwin Roberts. Some stories say that it was love at first sight. <laughs> However, there are other stories that say that when Edwin Roberts was sent around Wales to raise awareness of the possible settlement, they had already met in Mountain Ash. So, don't know which one is true. The thing is that on uh, 19th of April, 1866, uh, they married in Placet, and this is that wedding where uh, th there was a double wedding, um, and it was the first time that um, the um, uh, the Tewelche Indians sort of uh, approached the community. Um, her husband, uh, Edwin Roberts, died unexpectedly in 1893, a few days before re returning to Ladva from Wales. And she decided not to go back to Patagonia without him. So she died in May 1913 in Bethesda, where she's buried next to her husband. That's her there with him. Um, Mary Humphreys, I've already mentioned her birth when uh, I told you about Elizabeth Harriet Adams. Um, she had been born on 10th of August, 1865. And although she's gone down in history as the first baby to be born in Ladva, I've included her in this group for another reason. Uh, she was a midwife, and as such, Ariel Lloyd mentions that she helped about 3,000 babies to come into this world. Albina Sampini tells us that during the 1899 flood, Mary would row between farms, helping those who needed assistance during labor. She was also one of the promoters of the building of the hospital in Trelew, a hospital that is still functioning today. She married Robert Adna Davis from Dolwith Ellen on Christmas Day, 1886, when she was 21. Uh, he had arrived uh, in 1882. They had 11 children. She died on March 31st, 1928, and is buried in Moria. Eleanor Evans, unfortunately, I haven't got a photograph of Eleanor Evans, but Eleanor Evans, but I'm sure there must be somewhere, so uh, 
next time I talk about the women, I'll probably have it. Um, in 1862, Eleanor Evans was a widow with five children. That year, she met Thomas Davis in Aberdar, also a widower with four children. They married and traveled together to Patagonia aboard the Mimosa. When they landed, she refused point blank to get separated from her husband. So she walked to the valley with him and together with her nine children, instead of going on the Mary Ellen with all the other women and children. The last night, they stopped to rest under one of, the, under one of three weeping willows that they found in the area, and they named the place Tyr Heligan. Their home, Dufrindreinog, or Thorny Valley, was the first house built in Oladva, and it was the first house those traveling by sea would see when they arrived. Apart from their children, she also took care of Robert and Catherine Davis' child. You may remember that she day, died on August the 20th, 1865. Um, and it's been this big story about the DNA confirming that uh, it was actually Catherine Davis, uh, that those remains that had been found were actually hers. Um, Catherine's husband um, had died in 1968 with only, when he was only 43 years old. Um, so um, Eleanor and her husband took care, took care of, um, of uh, those children as well. Rachel Evans traveled in the Mimosa. She lost a one-year-old baby during the trip and gave birth to another before arriving in the new bay. Sadly, this baby died at three months. She was Aaron Jenkins' second wife. They had married in Merthyr Tidwell in September 1860. Um, for a long time, there was this, um, you know, sort of oral tradition everybody talked about, Rachel uh, having discovered this um, irrigation system. Um, in the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about, well, was it really Rachel, or was it, in fact, Aaron who discovered this? And you know, we've, we've heard in some of the conferences, like in Madrid, for example, um, about um, Aaron's um, role in discovering the, um, this irrigation system, coming up with this uh, irrigation system. Um, they may say what they want, but I'm sure that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it must have been. <laughs> now, um, she was only 35 when she died on the 15th of July, 1868, leaving a six-year-old son. I'm not going to make any comment about this next piece of information. I'm just going to let you draw your own con conclusions. I said she died on the 15th of July, 1868. Two months later, on September the 12th, 1868, Aaron Jenkins, who was 35, married Margaret Jones, who was 17. <laughs> Elizabeth Jones, also known as Betsy Hughes. Elizabeth and her husband John traveled to Uladva mainly because he had serious health problems and was looking for a more benign climate. She was 39 when they arrived and he was 30. They had been married since 1853 and traveled with their four children aged between 10 years old and 18 months. In the eight months following the landing, Elizabeth would suffer the loss of two of her, of her children, the baby in August the, seth, the 6th and a four-year-old girl in November, and of her husband John on March 13, 1866. Sorry, I need a John and his brother had been in charge of bringing the thousand sheep from Porth Madryn to Karantir. They had terrible weather those days with torrential rain for several days, sleeping on the mud, not being able to get dry to light a fire or cook their food. 
On the third day, they ran out of food, so John walked all the way on his own to Kairander and, re and Karantir and returned straight away without a rest. He never recovered from the ordeal. So he, he died in March 1866, but Beth, Betsy stayed on and raised their two sons, William John, who was 10 at the arrival, and John Samuel, who was two. There is a letter from 1872 where Betsy says that she is in possession of 13 cows, three horses, and three mares. She is quite happy and content, but complains about the fact that there are few people in Uladva. She died in her farm in Bonking in September 1894. Now, when the time of the Jubilee was approaching, a Dravod published a list of uh, all those um, that uh, traveled in the Mimosa. And as a separate section, there was this list of women traveling on their own. Um, they were Grace, Grace Roberts, Elizabeth Roberts, Mary Ann John, Catherine Hughes, Elizabeth Pritcher, and um, Ann Jones. I just want to mention a little bit about some of them. About them, um, about some of them, there is very little information actually. Um, Grace Roberts um, came from Flandegai, and she was 25 when she arrived in Ulladva. Three years later, she married James Barry Rees who'd also traveled in the Mimosa from Festiniog. He was the builder of the first chapel in Rauschen. They had seven children. Their farm was Hlisvod on the south side of the river, where she had a small collection of books she would lend to anybody interested in reading. At the conference in Madrid, Arie told us that um, whenever somebody returned a book to her, she would always ask questions about the book. So nobody dared return a book without having read it first. <laughs> She's buried in Moria. She died in August 1915 when she visited um, Richard Berwin's house, to whom she was um, related by marriage of one of her daughters. Um, Elizabeth Roberts from Bangor, very little is known about her. She traveled uh, when she was 19, and in uh, January 1866, she married in Trerauson with John Moylwin Roberts from Festiniog. He is in the photo in 1890, but she's not there. So um, we'll have to do a little bit more research to find out something else about her. Mary Ann John was from Abadar and was 24 when she boarded the Mimosa. Less than a year after landing, she married John Humphreys. Their wedding took place on March the 20th, 1866. We know that at some point he came back to Wales, uh, although um, there is a John Humphreys who later in 1875 turned up living in Santa Fe, north of Argentina, who might be the same person. Um, but I haven't found any more information about them about or about uh, Marianne. Catherine Hughes um, originally came from uh, Birkenhead. She was also 24 when she boarded the Mimosa and married Joshua Jones Kumaman on, in June 1867 in Madrid. He was 22. Elizabeth Pritchard uh, I don't need to tell you anything about her because Elionid has already uh, told us that um, she married um, Richard Jones Berwin. In fact, well, she had married um, Tommy Dimmel um, when she was 20, um, um, and he had been part of the crew from the Mimosa. Less than two years later, she was a widow um, because Tommy died in the De Denby shipwreck. And on Christmas Day, as Adrian um, had told us, uh, she married uh, Richard um, Jones Berwin, and they had 13 children. Um, Anne Jones um, was from Bethesda. At 24, it was like, looks like this 24 was like a, a the crisis year, yeah? <laughs> um, uh, 
She married Reza Hughes, who was 10 years her senior and who had two daughters. One was 18 and the other um, was five. If you remember the story about the captain of the Mimosa wanting to cut the hair of all the women on board to avoid a lice infestation, Rudder was the one who stood up to the captain and refused to have her daughter's hair cut. Uh, Rudder's uh, wife, first wife, uh, Sarah, had died on November the 9th, 1865, a few months after uh, the landing. Um, I want to mention Mevanui. Um, she was um, one of Lewis Jones and Alan Griffiths. Um, um, she was uh, born in Wales, as I said before. Um, she married Fluida P1, who was uh, four years older than her, Fluid, um, Michael D. Jones' uh, son, um, in a wedding that was uh, presided by Governor Fontana. She was 48 when um, the incident of Nantepescot and when she lost her husband there. And she uh, was left with six children. She later married Thomas Lewis, also um, a widower and father of six children. And um, they together lived in Brinkroon. And uh, later she lived in Trelew with her mother and then in Eskel and died in Gaiman where she lived in her daughter Meyer's uh, house. She died in 18, uh, 1965. I also wanted to mention Elinard Morgan, but having Wynne here, I'm only just going to mention her, and I'm not going to embarrass myself saying anything about him, her, except for quoting Wynne, who said she was one of the principal figures of romanticism in Wales at beginnings of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, she also started a school uh, for girls in Trelew and promoted the creation of what now we know as Kole um, While her father was not around, she would um, take charge of the publication of the Dravod, um, and um, she died in December 1938. Um, she was born uh, aboard the, uh, um, a ship that ironically was called Mavanui, just like her sister. Uh, and I always think that when we talk about uh, Elinette Morgan having been born in the Bay of Biscay, I think about the mother giving birth in the Bay of Biscay. Um, so here is, I think, if I've got a photograph of, uh, yeah, mother and um, two daughters and granddaughters. Um, I would like to go on. I would like to tell you more about several of the other women, but I'm just going to leave you with two photographs of the women that I think that um, have helped keep, maintain Uladva as it is uh, today. Uh, on the one hand, women like Evelyn Roberts, who translated the first, who the first one who translated to Spanish, um, Lewis Jones' work, Albina Jones de Sambini, uh, who did this wonderful um, uh, book about the women, uh, Cien Atuendos a y un sombrero, a hundred dresses and and a hat, uh, and all the work she done, she's done about. Um, the family trees. Gweneda Davis, who's recently passed. Um, Irma Hughes de Jones and May Hughes, uh, two wonderful women in Ladva. And of course, I have to finish with the wonderful sisters, Lynette and Taylor Roberts. Yeah.